In this lecture, we're going to think about how the moon appears to us. It goes through phases, those phases repeat, and every night when you look up at the moon, it looks a little bit different. The shadow on the moon is a little bit different. And so we're going to think about why that is and what the phases are, the names of the phases, and think about the moon's relationship with the Earth in its orbit. <clears throat> All right, so the the appearance of the moon, it, we call it its phase, right? That's that's whatever it looks like with its part illuminated, part in shadow. That's called a phase. And if from day to day it's getting more and more illuminated, we say that it is waxing. It's becoming more uh, covered in light. And if it's getting less and less illuminated from day to day, we call that waning. It's getting less covered in light. So the phase of the moon is either waxing or waning, or it could be completely illuminated and then not illuminated at all. We'll get to all the names of the different phases in the, the next slide. But I want to first, before, before moving on to that, take a closer look at the picture over here. This is a nice photograph of the moon. And you can see that part of it is in shadow and part of it is in light. The moon is not shining this light, it's reflecting it. So it's reflecting sunlight. And so half of the moon is always illuminated. But we don't always see half of the moon illuminated because our angle on it, our perspective on it is changing. But half of the moon is always illuminated by the sun. And then what it looks like to us, its phase, depends on our angle of view. Now wherever you look along this line where the shadow meets the light, you'll notice that there's a lot of detail that you can see. You can see the depth in the craters. It looks like rougher terrain along this shadow line. Well, the shadow line is called the terminator. It's where the shadow terminates or where the light terminates, I guess, however you want to look at it. Uh, and there's a reason why along the shadow line it looks bumpier. And it's not because it is bumpier. The surface over here is just as bumpy and the craters are just as deep as they are over here. But, but when you look near a shadow, the angle of the sunlight is coming in more steeply and so the shadows are longer. Right? Think about as the day goes on here on Earth. As the shadows get long, the sun is heading towards sundown. Right? The angle of the sunlight coming in steeper and steeper or I guess more shallow, more shallow, closer to the horizon. And so the shadows are get, on Earth are getting longer. When you're near noon, the shadows are at their shortest. Right. So if you go outside near noon, there's not a lot of shadows going on because the sun is relatively high in the sky. Well, the same thing is happening here on the moon. The sun is higher in the sky for the locations over here and lower in the sky for the locations over here. And so the shadows are longer and the shadows are allow us to see the detail. So when you want to see detail in the moon's surface, you look along the terminator line. <clears throat> All right, now this image shows you the phases of the moon through one complete cycle. The first phase, the starting phase, and we could in principle start anywhere, but where we traditionally start with the naming of the phases of the moon is with a totally not illuminated moon, which we call a new moon. So uh, in, in this picture here would be like the picture right before this one, where you can't even see a sliver, it's not illuminated. So this over here would be a new moon. Now we see that it returns to a new moon later on, but it starts new, not illuminated at all, and over time, the illumination spreads across the surface and it becomes more and more illuminated. During this stage, when you just get a sliver of the moon and it's getting more and more illuminated, we call that waxing crescent. So it's the shape of a crescent and it's waxing. It's getting more illuminated. Eventually, it will reach what looks to us to be half full. Now, as I've said earlier, the moon is always half illuminated by the sun whatever side happens to be facing the sun, but our perspective on it changes. All right, so you can think about that, like take this picture right here. This, the side that's illuminated is over here on this, 
So the sun, if you're thinking about it in three-dimensional space, instead of being like directly over here, the sun is like over here at an angle shining light on this side of the sun. But for us, it's a crescent. It's a waxing crescent. But eventually, it will look half full to us. Now, to me, it looks like about right here. It's about half full. And we call that the first quarter. This is the first quarter phase. Then it's continuing waxing, right? So it's still getting more and more illuminated until eventually it becomes totally full, totally illuminated, which we call a full moon, right? So new moon, waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous. So gibbous means more than half full and eventually full. Once you get to this point, everything just reverses. So it's fully illuminated. It can only get less. So it's waning, but it's still more than half full. So it's waning gibbous. Eventually, we reach the third quarter, which looks to me like in like sort of in between these two would be third quarter. And then uh, waning crescent back to new moon. And it repeats on a cycle of about a month period. So the moon goes through these phases. Early astronomers would have recorded this. What does the sun look like on each day? And noticed over time that it takes about 30 days for the sun to go through these, this full cycle and then do it again. Now, if you look at it in space, this is what it looks like. So this might illustrate it a little bit better, what I was talking about. Uh, the moon is always half illuminated. So when you look at these pictures here of the moon, they're always half illuminated as it's going around the sun. Whatever side is facing the sun is illuminated. But because we're looking at it from different angles, we see it. So here we'd see a crescent. Here we'd see a quarter. Here we'd see full. Here we'd see gibbous. So if you think about it in space, it's a little bit easier to understand why the moon goes through these phases. And it takes about a month, or what we call a month, for the moon to go around and cycle through all of these different phases. Uh, just one more important thing. The moon is orbiting counterclockwise. So I keep, I, I'm naturally thinking of it that way, but uh, it's not obvious that, it, that it's going this way. It, it is cycling around the Earth in this direction. So it's going around counterclockwise. We're northern biased, right? We think of things from the north hemisphere perspective. So this is counterclockwise to us. And in fact, the, the moon is going counterclockwise around the Earth, and the Earth is going counterclockwise around, around the sun. And that's true for most things in the solar system. Uh, from the northern hemisphere biased perspective, things in the solar system are generally going in that counterclockwise direction. So this is about how big the moon is. So slightly in the side, and we'll get back to the, the phases. But I, I wanted to mention that the moon is really big. Um, now, it's not big compared to the Earth. You should always be comparing things to other things. Uh, now, the moon is not big compared to the Earth, but it's big in the sense that most planets that have moons have moons relatively smaller than the moon is to the Earth. Let me take, take a minute. To, to make sure that makes sense, because I know it's kind of a complicated um, statement. So think about the, the Earth and the Moon. So the Moon's diameter is like 3,500 kilometers, and the Earth's is 12,800 kilometers or so. Uh, so if you took that ratio, that's a relatively big ratio compared to what it would be for most moons to, the, to the, their home planets. <clears throat> so let's think about the moon relative to other things in the solar system. So there's there's three other planets on here, then there's the dwarf planet, and then there's another moon. Um, so the Earth is obviously much bigger than Mercury. The moon's not that much smaller than Mercury. Uh, and it's not that much smaller than Mars. So the moon is, and it's bigger than Pluto, which used to be a planet. So the moon is sort of planet-sized, at least these 
these are what we call terrestrial planets, planets with solid surfaces. It's sort of the size of a small terrestrial planet. Now, if, if this was all that you knew, you'd say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, we have a moon that's about the size of a small terrestrial planet. Maybe that's normal. Well, this is the moon Titan, and, the, and our moon is smaller than Titan, uh, but it's not that much smaller than Titan. Right? It's a, a 1,500 or so, 1,600 or so kilometers smaller than Titan. Well, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. And Saturn, as we'll see later, is much, much bigger than the Earth. So it's rare for a planet that's Earth-sized to have a moon that's this size. <clears throat> We'd much more expect it to have moons like Mars, which are, would be little tiny dots on, on this picture, or had to have no moons at all. Uh, we, we, if we just saw Earth's moon out of context, if an astronomer just saw Earth's moon out of context, didn't know what it belonged to, we would probably think it, it's, a, it's a moon of like a gas giant planet. But it's not. It's our moon. And so uh, there has to be an explanation for why Earth's moon is so large. and if you're interested, you can ask me about it, and I can talk about that in, in more detail. But there's still some active research going on to try to understand better uh, why our moon is as big as it is. <clears throat> All right, so back to the, the moon's cycle uh, around the Earth. Uh, if you remember in the previous video, we talked about the two different kinds of days. Well, there are also two different kinds of months, and it's for the same reason that the Earth is moving in its orbit. So you could define a month as one 360-degree trip around the Earth. That would be a sidereal month, and that would be 27.3 days. And that would be fine. You could define a month that way. But in our sky, what you would see would not be a complete cycle of lunar phases. That would be a synodic month, and that's 29.5 days. Uh, now, in the Earth's orbit around the sun, we decided it moved about a degree per day. Now we're talking about a you know 27 to 29.5 day chunk of time, and so it's not going to move one degree in its orbit. It's going to move noticeably farther, closer to like 30 degrees in its orbit, and so it's a it's a more appreciable difference. The difference between a sidereal day and a solar day was only four minutes. The difference in these two kinds of months is a couple of days time. And that's because the Earth has moved, uh, you know, a 30 degree chunk of its orbit around the sun. So what we want to have for our definition of a month, a, a useful definition of a month, is for the moon to return to the same spot in the sky. So look at this orientation here. This is a full moon. Right? The sunlight is going to hit the moon and reflect back to the Earth, and we'll see the full half, the full half, uh, the, the, the half of the moon that is fully illuminated in our sky. Well, when will that happen again? If it just goes 360 degrees, it will be back to here. And this half on this side will be fully illuminated. We won't see it as a full moon. It'll be waxing gibbous. It needs to continue orbiting around here in order to get back to uh, a full moon again. So this is after a sidereal period, it's back to here. We need to get back to this line, the line between the Earth and Sun. So it needs to go an extra certain amount. If you're really interested in how the math works out for this and how you get to exactly 29.5 days, uh, I put a document on Moodle that explains it all, works through the calculation. It's not that long, it's like a page and a half. Uh, so if you're interested in that and, and math's your thing, uh, you might find that interesting. And you can see exactly how we work out what this angle is and, and how you get to 29.5 days. But that's where our months, why our months are about 29.5 days, or about 30 days. Now, not only is it going on this repeating cycle around the Earth, but we 
always see the same face of the moon as it goes around that cycle. And we call that synchronous rotation. So in the, in the diagram here, we have a person standing on the Earth. And that person is always facing the Earth, or always has the Earth as, at its zenith as it goes around. Now, that's very different than the way the Earth goes around the Sun. The Earth's rotating relative to its orbit of the Sun. The Moon is rotating around on its axis at precisely the right rate so that the same face of the, earth, of the, of the Moon is always facing the Earth. Now, if you said, well, said, well that, that's, that's just way too much of a coincidence. That, that can't be a coincidence. Uh, you would be right. It's not a coincidence. It's actually a result of the tidal forces, the forces of gravity between the Earth and the Moon, uh, which cause the Moon to stretch. Now, in the next video, we'll talk about the tidal forces of the Moon on the Earth, but this is a result of the tidal forces of the Earth on the Moon. And the details of this are pretty complicated, but the, the bottom line is the Earth makes the Moon stretch a little bit in the direction of the Earth. And over time, if the Moon is, relati is rotating relative to its orbit, it will feel a drag force that will cause it to slow down. And eventually, it will come into sync so that the, the stretched direction uh, is always facing the Earth. Now the picture is, is exaggerated, it's a more subtle effect than this, but over time the Moon has come into synchronous rotation, we always see the same face of the Moon, and so we call that the near side, so we always get to see the near side, and we never get to see the far side. The only time people have seen the far side of the Moon is when we have sent astronauts out to the moon to take pictures of it and transmit them back to us. Otherwise, we always see the same face of the moon as it orbits around, around us. And that's, it's not a, a coincidence. It's a fact of gravity that any two orb, things orbiting one another will eventually become tidally locked. If we were able to fast forward long enough, the moon would actually slow down the Earth so that the same face of the Earth was always facing the same face of the Moon, and they would be tidally locked together. They would be in synchronous rotation together. Right now, we just have synchronous rotation of the Moon around the Earth. But fast forward far enough in time, the Moon is slowing the Earth's rotation down slightly until they come into sync with one another. Now, that will take such a long time that it's not going to matter. Other things will happen in the solar system that disrupt the Earth's orbit before then. Uh, but it is a fact of, of physics that, that uh, the forces of gravity between two objects in rotation will eventually put them into sync with one another so that they're rotating. Sort of like thinking about um, ice skater to figure skaters, like a pair of figure skaters holding hands as they spin around their faces facing one another. Um, that's what all orbiting things will be like eventually. So in, in this image here, we get a look of, at what the near side of the moon looks like. So this is what we see, a kind of high con contrast image of the near side of the moon that we are familiar with. This is, the, the, this is what the moon looks like to us uh, on, a, on a nightly basis. There are dark regions and lighter regions. The darker regions are called the mare. Mare is a word that means sea. And so early thoughts were that these dark regions must be oceans. There must be oceans on the moon, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, the word has stuck, but we now know that's not true. Instead of being oceans, they're actually lava fields, essentially, where where magma has come up through the surface of the moon and spread and covered up the craters. And now that soil is very nice and soft and powdery. When we've sent uh, missions to the moon, we often land, or often did land, in the Mare. Most notably, the Apollo 11 astronauts landed in Mare Tranquilitatis. 
also known as the Sea of Tranquility, because those are soft landing spots. In contrast to that, we have these lighter areas on the moon, and those are where we see all the craters, and they're called the highlands. They're mountainous, bumpy regions, and it's a little more dangerous to land in, in those places. So let's go to the other side, not the near side, but the far side. This is what the far side of the moon looks like. Notice it's not quite the same. It's a lot more highlands and very little of what you would call mare. It's much more heavily cratered. Why would that be? Why would it be that one side of the moon, the side that we get to see, is very different from the other side? Well, this is also an effect of gravity. So the moons come into synchronous rotation with the Earth because of gravity, because of these tidal forces, which we'll, we'll get into that word tidal because it's related to our tides. Uh, we'll get into that in the next video. But those forces have caused, or that force I should say, it's just one force, the force of gravity, has caused the synchronous rotation but it's also had an effect on the interior of the moon. And so when we sent astronauts to the moon, we were able to make a seismographic map of the inside of the moon. By, by putting seismographic equipment on the surface, we could map out the interior of the moon. And we learned in those experiments that the core of the moon is actually pulled towards the Earth. So it's, the core of the moon is not at the center, the geometric center. It's actually pulled towards the, the side that we face, the near side. And what that means is that the magma that was within the moon, when it was more active, it's now not geologically active, but when it was, the magma was closer to the surface of the near side than it was the far side. So the magma couldn't make it to the far side. So any craters that, that, that appeared on the the far side couldn't get covered up. The magma couldn't get from the core to the surface of the far side, but it could get from the core to the surface of the near side. And so we see the mare on the near side, but not on the far side. Okay, so we're not done talking about the moon, but we're, we're, we're mostly done with, with, ta with what we wanted to say in this video. In the next video, we'll get into those tidal forces in more detail, and we'll think about not how the Earth has had effect on the moon, but how the moon has had an effect on the Earth and, and um, how it, that leads to our tides and, and what our tides do in the cycle of, of those tides on a daily basis. So we'll get into that in the next video, and, um, and then one more after that on eclipses. And that's when the Earth or Moon is in the shadow and uh, results in some really interesting views that we get from the Earth.